Joe Gould was an odd and penniless and unemployable little man who came to the city in 1916 and ducked and dodged and held on as hard as he could for over 35 years. In my hometown, he once wrote, I never felt at home. I stuck out. Even in my own home, I never felt at home. In New York City, especially in Greenwich Village, down among the cranks and the misfits and the one lungers and the has-beens and the might-have-beens and the would-bees and the never-wills and the God-knows-whats, I have always felt at home. Gould looked like a bum and lived like a bum. He spent most of his time hanging out in diners, cafeterias, and bar rooms in the village. On occasion, he stole. He usually stole books from bookstores and sold them to secondhand bookstores. All through the years, a long succession of men and women gave him old clothes and small sums of money and bought him meals and drinks and paid for his lodging and invited him to parties and to weekends in the country and helped him get such things as glasses and false teeth or otherwise took an interest in him, some for reasons that they themselves probably weren't all sure of, and some because they believed that a book he had been working on for many years might possibly turn out to be a good book, even a great one, and wanted to encourage him to continue working on it. He told people he met in village joints that the oral history was already millions upon millions of words long, and beyond any doubt the lengthiest unpublished literary work in existence, but that it was nowhere near finished. In 1952, Gould collapsed on the street and was taken to Columbus Hospital. Columbus transferred him to Bellevue, and Bellevue transferred him to the Pilgrim State Hospital in West Brentwood, Long Island. In 1957, he died there, aged 68, of arterial sclerosis and senility. Directly after the funeral, friends of his in the village began trying to find the manuscript of the oral history. After several days, they turned up three things he had written, a poem, a fragment of an essay, and a begging letter. In the next month or so, they found a few more begging letters. From then on, they were unable to find anything at all. In 1942, for reasons that I will go into later, I became involved in Gould's life, and I kept in touch with him during his last 10 years of the city. I spent good many hours during those years listening to him. I listened to him when he was sober, and I listened to him when he was drunk. I listened to him when he was cast down and meek, when, as he used to say, he felt so low he had to reach up to touch bottom. And I listened to him when he was in moods of incoherent exaltation, and gradually, without intending to, I learned some things about him that he may not have wanted me to know, or, on the other hand, since his mind was circuitous and he loved wheels within wheels, that he may very well have wanted me to know. In any case, I am quite sure that I know why the manuscript of the oral history has not been found. When Gould died, I made a resolution to keep this as well as some of the other things I had inadvertently learned about him to myself. To do so otherwise, it seemed to me at the time, would be disloyal. Let the dead past bury its dead. But since then, I have come to the conclusion that my resolution was pointless and that I should tell what I know, and I am going to do so. If it was possible for the real Joe Gould to have any feeling about the matter one way or the other, he wouldn't be in the least displeased if I told anything at all about him that I happened to know. Quite the contrary. I first saw Gould in the winter of 1932. At that time, I was a newspaper reporter, working mostly on crime news. Every now and then, I covered a story in women's court, which in those days was in Jefferson Market Courthouse at 6th Avenue and 10th Street in Greenwich Village. In the block below the courthouse, there was a Greek restaurant named The Athens that was a hangout for people who worked in the court and often had business in it. Toward the end of the 30s, I quit my newspaper job and went to work for The New Yorker. Around the same time, I moved to the village and I began to see Gould frequently. I would catch glimpses of him going into or coming out of one of the bar rooms on Lower 6th Avenue, the Jericho Tavern, or the Village Square Bar and Grill, or the Belmar, or Goodies, or the Rochambeau. I would see him sitting scribbling at a table in the Jackson Square branch of the public library. 
or I would see him filling his fountain pen in the main village post office, the one on 10th Street. Or I would see him sitting among the young mothers and the old alcoholics in the sooty, pigeony, crumb besprinkled, newspaper bestrewn, privet choked, coffin shaped little park at Sheridan Square. One morning in the summer of 1942, it occurred to me that he might be a good subject for a profile. I worked a good deal at night at the time, and now and then, on my way home, around two or three in the morning, I would see him on 6th Avenue or on a side street. I remember telling my editor that I thought Gould was a perfect example of the type of eccentric widespread in New York City, the solitary nocturnal wanderer. I was afraid that I might have trouble persuading Gould to talk about himself. I really knew next to nothing about him, and had got the impression that he was austere and aloof. I left the office around 11 and went down to the village and began going to places along 6th Avenue and bringing up Gould's name and getting into conversations about him. In the middle of the afternoon, I telephoned the switchboard operator at the office and asked if there were any messages for me, and she immediately switched me to the receptionist, who said that a man had been sitting in the reception room for an hour or so waiting for me to return. I'll put him on the phone, she said. Hello, this is Joe Gould, the man said. I heard that you wanted to talk to me, so I dropped in. We agreed to meet at 9.30 the next morning in a diner on 6th Avenue in the village called the Jefferson. The Jefferson, it is gone now, was one of those big, roomy, jukeboxy diners. It was on the west side of 6th Avenue at the conjunction of 6th Avenue, Greenwich Avenue, Village Square, and 8th Street, which is the heart and hub of the village. I went over and introduced myself to Gould and he immediately drew himself up. I didn't get much sleep last night, he said. I slept on the porch at St. Joseph's RC until they opened the doors for the first mass. St. Joseph's at 6th Avenue in Washington Place is the principal Roman Catholic church in the village and one of the oldest churches in the city. It has two large freestanding columns on its porch behind which, shielded from the street, generations of unfortunates have slept. We took a booth and the waitress brought Gould's coffee. It was in a thick white mug, diner style, and it was so hot it was steaming. Even so, tipping the mug slightly toward him without taking it off the table, he bent down and immediately began drinking it with little, cautious, quick, bird-like sips and gulps interspersed with little whimpering sounds indicating pleasure and relief. And all at once his eyes became brighter and color returned to his face, and his twitch disappeared. I had never before seen someone react so quickly and so noticeably to coffee. Brandy probably wouldn't have done any more for him, or cocaine, or an oxygen tent, or a blood transfusion. His tone of voice was condescending. He had got some of his confidence back. My full name is Joseph Ferdinand Gould, and I was named for my grandfather, who was a doctor. I should have been born in Boston, but I wasn't. Norwood is a fairly good-sized old Yankee town about 15 miles southwest of Boston. I knew from the time I was a little boy and fainted at the sight of blood that I was going to be a disappointment. To begin with, I was undersized. I was a runt, a shrimp, a peanut, a half pint, a tadpole. My nickname, when anybody thought to use it, was Pee Wee. Little by little, through the years, I had come to hate Norwood. I had come to hate it with all my heart and soul. There were days... If wishes could kill, I would have killed every man, woman, and child in Norwood. So I told my father that I have decided to go to New York and engage in literary work. I came to New York with the idea in mind of getting a job as a dramatic critic, for I thought that would leave me time to write novels and plays and poems and songs and essays and an occasional scientific paper. I did succeed in getting a job as a sort of half-messenger boy, half-assistant police headquarters reporter for the evening mail. One morning in the summer of 1917, I was sitting in the sun on the back steps of headquarters recovering from a hangover. The idea for the oral history occurred to me around half past 10. Around a quarter to 11, I stood up and went to a telephone and quit my job. And here's the greatest triumph of my life so far, the dial for April 1929. There are two essays from the oral history in it. Marianne Moore, the poet, was editor of the dial and her office was right down here in the village, on 13th Street, just east of 7th Avenue. It was one of those old houses, red brick, three stories high, a steep stoop leading up from the parlor floor, an alianthus tree growing at a slant in front that have always typified the village to me. Outside the diner, on the sidewalk, we agreed to meet again on Saturday night, but not in the diner, Gould said. 
we decided we would meet in Goodies, one of the saloons on 6th Avenue in the village. On Saturday night, June 13th, 1942, I went into Goodies to keep the appointment I had made with Gould. Goodies was on 6th Avenue between 9th and 10th Streets, directly across the avenue from the Jefferson Market Courthouse. I had often noticed the place, but this was the first time I had ever been in it. Like most of the bar rooms on 6th Avenue in the village, it was long and narrow and murky, a blind tunnel of a place, a burrow, a bat's cave, a bear's den. Gould giggled. He asked me if I had read the chapters of the oral history he had given me. I said that I had, and that they had been a good deal different from what I had expected, and that I would like to read some more. I have an old friend named Aaron Siskind, and the great bulk of the oral history is stored in his flat up over a second-hand bookstore at 102 4th Avenue, Gould said. I must have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or a dozen composition books stuck away up there. Siskin's flat was over the corner bookshop at 4th Avenue and 11th Street, right in the middle of the second-hand bookstore district. He came to the door, a short, jovial man with skeptical eyes, and I told him what I was after. And he laughed. Good God, he said. Haven't you got anything better to do with your time than that? However, he went at once to a clothes closet and picked up five composition books. Joe comes up here every few days and hits me for a handout, or what he calls a contribution to the Joe Gould Fund, and if he happens to have a finished composition book with him, he goes over and tosses it in the closet. When he gathers up his composition books and puts them in his portfolio, where does he take them, I asked. He's always been kind of vague and remote about that, Siskin said. I guess he has some secret place or other where he takes them and stores them away. The profile of Gould was printed in the issue of The New Yorker for December 12, 1942. The day before this issue hit newsstands, I had to go down south. When I got back to my office, there was a pile of letters on my desk from readers of the profile. Among the letters addressed to me was one from Gould himself. I have always had a feeling of being way ahead of my time, Gould wrote. Consequently, I have always taken it for granted that the importance of the oral history would not be recognized until sometime in the distant future. I'm not just that nut Joe Gould, but that nut Joe Gould who may wind up being considered one of the great historians of all time, as great as Froissart, as great as John Aubrey, as great as Gibbon. I still make the rounds of the places on 6th Avenue, but I have a new hangout, the Mineta Tavern at the corner of McDougal Street and Mineta Lane in the Italian part of the village. I had a friend in the publishing business, Charles A. Pierce of Duell, Sloan, and Pierce, and a few days later I called him and it turned out that he also had the thought of the possibility of putting out a book of selections from the oral history. I'd like to have a talk with Gould and explore the idea, Pierce said. On Friday afternoon, September 3rd, 1943, around three o'clock, Gould showed up in my office. 20 minutes later, Pierce put his head in my door and said that he happened to be in the neighborhood and thought he'd drop by and say hello. Pierce and Gould talked for a few minutes about a village poet they both knew, and then Pierce said that he had been hearing about the oral history for years and would like to read some of it. Some of it, said Gould. Everybody wants to read some of it. Nobody wants to just read it. From now on, I'm not going to let anybody read some of it. They'll read all of it or none of it. Well, Pierce said, I'll do that. It may take me a long time, but I'll make a start today or tomorrow. Gould took a deep breath. I've always been resolved in the back of my mind that the oral history would be published posthumously, he said, and I'm going to stick to that. He hesitated a moment. There are revelations in it, he continued, that I don't want the world to know until after I'm dead. That stopped Pierce, and he said he would be running along. I was exasperated. I turned on Gould. You told me you lugged armfuls of the oral history into and out of 14 publishing offices, I said. Why in hell did you do that and go to all that trouble if you've always been resolved in the back of your mind that it would be published posthumously? I'm beginning to believe that the oral history doesn't exist. This remark came from my unconscious, and I was barely aware of the meaning of what I was saying. I was simply getting rid of my anger. But the next moment, glancing at Gould's face, I knew as well as I knew anything that I had blundered upon the truth about the oral history. My God, I said, it doesn't exist. I was appalled. There isn't any such thing as the oral history, I said. It doesn't exist. In those years, I used to go downtown at night on the Fifth Avenue bus. I usually got off at my stop at 10th Street around 7.30. Gould knew this, and about once a week he would be waiting for me. When I stepped off the bus, he would appear out of the shadows in the doorway of the Church of the Ascension on the corner and hurry over to the bus stop and join me. 
He had been having dizzy spells, he said. I got on the subway at 14th Street, intending to go off at 23rd Street Station, and a moment after I sat down, I had a kind of blackout, and when I came to, the train was pulling into the station at 72nd Street. Around the middle of December that year, I became conscious of the fact that I hadn't seen Gould at the bus stop for several weeks. In January 1953, I went to a party at the house of a psychiatrist I had known ever since I was a young reporter and covered Bellevue Hospital and the medical examiner's office. We have an old friend of yours at Pilgrim State, she said. The man you wrote about who's the author of an oral history of the world, or whatever he calls it, Joe Gould. I'm afraid there isn't a hell of a lot that can be done. I'm afraid poor Joe is getting on down toward the end of the line. On Sunday, August 18th, 1957, around 11 o'clock at night, Gould's friend Gottlieb telephoned me and said he had just been notified that Gould had died. By the way, where is the oral history, he asked me. I said that I didn't know. Well, said Gottlieb, we'll just have to start telephoning and getting in touch with all the people who knew him best and call a meeting and form a committee. One of the few things I've learned going through life is that there is a time and place for everything, and I didn't think that this was the time or the place to be telling one of Joe Gould's oldest friends that I didn't believe the oral history existed. Joe wasn't even in his grave yet. He wasn't even cold yet. And this was no time to be telling his secret. It could keep. Let them go ahead and look for the oral history, I thought. After all, I thought, I could be wrong. Hell, I thought, and the thought made me smile. Maybe they'll find it. You will be on the committee, won't you? He asked. Yes, I said. Continuing to play the role I had stepped into the afternoon, I discovered that the oral history did not exist. A role that I am only now stepping out of. Of course I will.